there was some problem with live stream. Is it fixed now? I mean, we don't have to, but I don't mind if it doesn't work. Well, we made it work for you. Oh. <laughs> Are we live? Okay. It's my pleasure to introduce Alex. Uh, Alex is an electrical engineering master student in her second semester. And she is attending this course to learn more about the device she uses on her daily life for studies and for her work and to improve her competencies in reading research papers. And with that, Alex, yeah, go ahead see how that one went. Um, can you hear me well? Okay, perfect. So let's get started. Um, welcome everybody to my presentation on a case for intelligent RAM. I have found it to be a very interesting paper. I've learned a lot and I'm very happy to share with you my takeaways and thoughts. So let's get started. So first of all, I would like to give you a brief summary on the whole paper. Let's start with the problem it aims at. So in 1997, so quite some while ago, we are facing a growing gap between microprocessor and DRAM speed. And it's growing roughly at 50% per year. And furthermore, the size and organization of memory on a single DRAM chip is becoming more and more awkward to use. This is where the authors come up with intelligent RAM or IRAM, which basically merges processing and memory into a single chip to lower memory latency, increase memory bandwidth, and also to improve energy efficiency. Specifically, the paper reviews the current state of microprocessors and DRAMs as of 1997. It explores some of the opportunities and challenges of IRAMs, as well as it estimates performance and energy efficiency for three specific IRAM designs. In conclusion, the results show that IRAM does present opportunities in performance, energy efficiency, and cost, but we need more accurate answers at that time to many questions before an actual revolution in the semiconductor industry can occur. So let's dive into the paper. We'll quickly cover the paper summary. So look at the paper overview and objectives, cover a little bit of the background and discuss the problem a little bit in more detail. Then we will discuss the solution statement of the authors, dive into the methodology and results and end with a conclusion. Afterwards, we'll look at the paper analysis, discuss the strengths and weaknesses. I'll share my takeaways with you and then we can get started with a discussion. So let's start with our first point here, the paper overview. So the paper is called A Case for Intelligent RAM, and it was published in IEEE Micro in 1997. It's the first paper I've read that is older than me. It's just uh, <laughs> quite a surprise. Um, and it was published by uh, these eight authors, all from University of California, Berkeley, with David Patterson opa, in a lead. Um, he... I think he did a round of 40 years of research in the field of architecture and is also really recognized by companies out there. I think he's a distinguished engineer at um, Google, which is quite a thing. So let's see what they did. The objectives of this paper are, first of all, to review the current state of microprocessors and DRAMs as of today, meaning in 1997. What does it look like? Secondly, we want to explore really what are the opportunities and what are the challenges of IRAM. Then we want to get an idea of what is the performance and energy efficiency we can expect of three different IRAM designs. Let's jump to the background. What was the world back in 1997? I'm not sure whether a lot of people can answer that here. Um, but in terms of the semiconductor industry, we were divided in two camps. So on one hand side, we were uh, producing microprocessors as a separate chip. And on the other hand, the same for DRAMs. So we, we are working with two separate chips. Now, this of course has a few advantages. First of all, you can tailor your fabrica fabrication lines much better to suit a specific device. 
In case of microprocessors, this means that you can have fast transistors to make fast logic and many layers, which on one hand accelerates communication and on the other hand, it simplifies power distribution. For DRAM production lines, this means many polysilicon layers to achieve both small DRAM cells and low leakage current to reduce the DRAM refresh rates. Secondly, that was quite a surprise for me. <laughs> I would not have thought of it in the first place, is um, this enabled separate packaging. And this is important because microprocessors rather use more expensive packages than uh, DRAM. So if you can save costs, this is always a good thing. Last but not least, this means for computer designers that they can actually scale the number of memory chips independently of the number of processors. This is important because a lot of uh, systems don't need the same amount. So everything seems fine. We have so many advantages. So can't we just keep going like that? The answer is no, we can't. So let's see why this is the case. And if you look at this graph, we we should see a problem. I hope you can see it. So here you can see that while microprocessor perform, uh, performance has been improving at a rate of roughly 60% per year, the access time to DRAM has been only improving at less than 10% per year. So we are left with a 50% gap. And as a result, uh, computer designers are faced with a more and more increasing pro processor memory performance gap, which during that time was the primary obstacle to improved computer system performance. And here it's really important to um, emphasize that our main issue here is now we have this long latency and we have this limited bandwidth, and this is limiting us in regards of performance in many applications. Now let's look at a very specific case, a real world um, case. Uh, maybe some of you recognize this. This is the Alpha 21164. During that time, this was the fastest current microprocessor. And let's look at, first of all, how it looks like and then see how does it perform? Is it really limited? Are we really facing a problem? So first of all, uh, this microprocessor has three on-chip caches and um, a third level four megabyte cache off chip. Um, I won't go into details here. We can later uh, discuss them in more detail due to time constraints. So yeah, on the left-hand side, you can see some benchmark programs. We ran this chip against. So all of these kind of execute different uh, calculations, which is important to know as bars relates to uh, matrix computations. And now let's discuss the results a bit. Here on the right hand side, we can see the fraction of time spent in each component. So we can see the pro uh, processor and the different kinds of caches. And I did the math for you here. So we can see that for the two benchmark programs here at the bottom, the database and the matrix computation, 75% of the time we are just spending in memory hierarchy, which I hope you would agree with me is, is not very good. And you can see, even though the Alpha 21164 can execute four instructions per clock cycle, uh, this refers to a CPI of 0 0.25, the average CPI here on the top for these applications was 3 to 3.6. So this is a factor of around 12. Now, we also need to keep in mind here that these extraordinary delays in memory, uh, in memory hierarchy occur despite tremendous resources dedicated to bridging this processor memory performance gaps. Uh, some people tried to implement uh, deeper and deeper cache hierarchies, but in the end, this resulted sometimes in even longer uh, latency. So to quickly summarize, we see that there's a huge gap and it's growing during that time uh, between the processor and DRAM speed. Secondly, also the size and organization of memory on single DRAM chips is becoming more and more awkward to use. This is especially the case for, um, um, for systems with error correction codes. So like other guy, um, I hope you realize as well as him that we can't keep going like that, right? And the authors agree. This is why they actually suggest IRAM. So what is IRAM? Let's take a look. IRAM is basically the idea of unifying the logic and DRAM on a single chip. 
So just to recall, currently we are fabricating them on, on separate lines. If we basically add them, uh, simply speaking, we are left with IRA. So what makes IRA attractive? There are a couple of advantages. First of all, it offers a higher bandwidth. And if you, for example, add more metal layers, you can have um, a larger cross chip uh, bandwidth. You are uh, left with a lower latency um, as well as an energy efficiency. If you uh, think about it using IRAM, you will not perform as many um, external memory accesses, which use a lot of energy. Then in terms of memory size and width, you are more flexible because you can choose a specific uh, word number and width. And also board space, quite a simple one, but still an advantage. If you have two chips and basically combine them in one, um, you are saving valuable board space. But we also have some challenges which we need to face, especially in terms of retention time during um, high temperature processing. We could be faced with we could be facing a huge increase in um, I forgot the word in refresh rates. Okay, maybe I will uh, remember it. Uh, a second challenge is uh, system scaling. This paper only really captures like, okay, what's the case if we have one IRAM, but what if we need more memory? How, how should we actually e expand this idea? Then industry matching, of course. Currently, everybody is using a similar technology in terms of DRAM, and we are not really interchangeable with them. In terms of area and power impact, if you would like to implement IRAM, this would lead to more input output lines needed, which would again then lead to a higher cost per bit. And we don't want to waste any money. Last but not least, if you're just testing a DRAM, you will need a certain amount of time and cost. But if you're adding uh, basically a processor to it, this cost will increase and also the time will increase. So, Let's jump to the methodology the authors uh, chose to actually evaluate the IRAM solution. And what they did was basically, they discussed three specific IRAM designs. The first one being, they looked at the current fastest microprocessor, the Alpha 21164, I hope you remember it, and they compared it to its IRAM implementation. Secondly, they looked at the current fastest vector uniprocessor, T, uh, Cray T90, and compare that one to its iron version. And last but not least, they looked at the um, energy efficiency of the digital strong arm memory and compared it to an iron memory system. So let's go one by one. You can see it. Okay. So here, I hope you remember the last big table we saw. It looks quite similar because here again, we have our different benchmark programs. And as you can see, instead of one value, we now have for each component an optimistic and a pessimistic value. Um, the offers uh, introduced that in particular to reflect more the reality. And on the right hand side, we can basically see the results. A value above one means that our program runs, uh, runs slower. Uh, uh, when we implement it in iron version, a uh, value below one means that it actually runs faster. And what we can see here for the uh, spec 92 benchmarks, the iron version actually performs not that well, right? It's slower than uh, the alpha 21164. But this is also because these benchmarks are known for spending little time in memory hierarchy. Nevertheless, the authors mentioned that even though it doesn't perform that well for the upper two benchmarks, the IRAM, IRAM Alpha still falls within the acceptable range of the highest performance microprocessors. You can especially see that for the case of database and matrix computations. We also need to take into account that if the memory gap continues to grow, we can expect IRAMs to actually have an even better performance to conventional designs. Now let's move on to our second design. And Horace, I will show a bigger picture later. Uh, the iron vector processors. This is re I, I have I think a too small head. <laughs> this is okay. So and um, here I will give you some background to this design. 
So first of all, we need to know that high-speed microprocessors rely on instruction-level parallelism in programs. So you can execute a lot of things at the same time, right? Now, there is an alternative to that, which is um, called vector processing. And basically, vector processes do not rely on data caches for high performance, but on low latency main memory. And to give you a bit uh, better understanding of vector processors and how they work, imagine if you uh, are working with vectors. You have two vectors and you want to add them. If I ask you, please add them, um, and how many instructions are you actually giving these two vectors, you would say one. I'm adding one vector plus the other. So I executed one addition. But actually, if you look at the memories, uh, at the vector elements inside, you performed multiple additions. So this is basically the idea of uh, vector processing instead of, um, OK. So, and because IRAM has low latency and is really highly interleaved, it naturally matches these needs of a vector processor. I hope you can see there uh, the correlation. Now, the authors looked at the current fastest vector uniprocessor, which is the Cray T90. Sometimes I wrote Cry T90, but I think that was because I was reading papers very late in the evening. I corrected it. But the Cray T90 achieves a speed of roughly 1.5 GFLOPs on an area of 1,000 uh, millimeters squared. If you compare it to an iron vector processor, you can see it offers 16 GFLOPs on an even smaller area, so 600 millimeters squared. So you can see, okay, the performance here is um, uh, quite well. So here, just again, um, this is an image of the architecture design of the iron vector uh, processor and here on the left hand side you can see these vector registers where we just um, on top perform some high level instructions but on on uh, vectors which gives us basically um, the same performance as um, in the what's the word uh, in case of instruction level parallelism now let's move on to the last design which is basically the st uh, digital strong arm where they did not really com uh, compare the uh, performance, but rather the energy efficiency. And what they did here, you can see some benchmarks uh, also for the energy case, like Perl and ALI and GC GCC. And, I, and the office decided to evaluate uh, the two designs in a ratio of 16 to 1 and 32 to 1. And the results show that depending on the benchmark you choose, the IRAM advantage is roughly a factor of two to four, which is quite significant. Let's move on to a conclusion. We saw that we are facing a problem, not only in regard that we have a growing gap between DRAM speed and processor speed, but also the size and organization of, of uh, memory is not nice to deal with currently. As a solution, the offers suggest intelligent RAM or also IRAM, which is the idea of merging processing and memory into a single chip. This offers many advantages. It lowers memory latency, it increases memory bandwidth. Um, we can improve energy efficiency, but it also offers us to increase flexibility in selection of memory size and organization, and it reduces board space. When looking at the three different designs, we saw in the case of the IRAM Alpha that even though in some cases it performed less well, uh, overall it still falls within the acceptable range for highest performance microprocessors during that time. We need to consider here that the offers say if they would design an IRAM architecture from the ground, they would use a different kind of implementation. So this is really basically we're taking the architecture we have right now and just converting it into IRAM and not really looking at how can we do it starting from zero. Next, we look at the iron vector processor. We, we saw that the, um, this one naturally matches the needs of a vector processor. In terms of the iron memory system, when we compared the digital strong arm to its iron memory uh, system, we saw that uh, the advantage is roughly a factor of two to four. And let's move on to the paper analysis and first discuss the strengths. 
The main thing I liked about this paper was that it examines the fastest microprocessor of that time, the alpha 21164. This is particularly important because this is what your solution needs to compete against, right? We need to invent something or improve something so it is better than the state of the alpha art out there, because otherwise no company will choose our solution and implement it. Secondly, uh, in the case of the IOM Alpha, the authors picked optimistic and pessimistic values. I find this quite nice because it gives you a more realistic view on what is possible. Next, the paper considers a really wide scope of the research question. So they really, the authors mentioned multiple times that you cannot only go for performance. You also need to be sure that the cost does not explode. So people, so companies out there can actually adapt your uh, solution. Next, the paper is quite brave. It states many assumptions on the future development of IRAM. They particularly did that for the vector processor. Uh, I really like that because now around 25 years later, when we read this paper and we see how they stated these assumptions, we can draw learnings from that. And when we try to assume something in the future, we have some reference and maybe can assume better. <laughs> Next, I really like the introduction to the initial problem. I think it's very important because otherwise nobody will dive into your methodology and your results. And this paper does a good job in communicating what the problem is and also why it is important. Last but not least, uh, the paper provides a specific follow-up, uh, specific follow-up questions at the end of it. Uh, it was the first time that I saw that in a paper, so specifically stated. And I really liked it because I think it makes it easier to build research on top of it. And it shows you the authors really thought even further what needs to be done outside the range of the paper. Next, the weaknesses. First of all, um, so the paper mentions the fastest current vector uh, uniprocessor, the Cray T90 but it does not evaluate against any benchmark programs how, um, like it did for the Alpha 21164. Even though there was an evaluation, um, I think it's on one hand the consistency that was missing for me in that case. If you evaluate two designs, um, I would like to, to be able to compare them against each other, especially because they say that the um, vector unit process is especially suited um, iron adaption. Next, um, the paper evaluates different designs according to different metrics, mat matrices. So uh, basically the Alpha 21164 and the Cray T90 are both evaluated against like performance. But on the other hand, uh, the digital strong arm and its iron version are evaluated against energy efficiency. While um, I'm happy they included both matrices as both are important, I would have liked um, to see a consistent performance evaluation on all chips, uh, on all designs, because it really makes it difficult to draw the lines to each other and compare them. Now, it is not quite clear why Digital Strongarm was chosen to, uh, to be compared to IRAM in terms of energy efficiency as a third design. I would have um, imagined because uh, the Alpha 211 was introduced as the fastest current microprocessor, and the Cray T90 was introduced as the fastest current vector uniprocessor. Um, nothing in this sense was done for the digital strong arm IRAM memory system. Next, the difference in design between the digi digital strong arm uh, compared to Alpha 21164 or the vector processor. Uh, were not um, introduced. I showed you the design of the uh, vector processor. I showed you also the parameters for the Alpha 21164 design. Um, nothing of that was included in the paper, which I thought was, again, inconsistent and important information that was missing. Next, in my opinion, the paper varied strongly in its readability. While it had a strong introduction and a strong conclusion, I felt in between, especially when going through the different designs, uh, sometimes it was hard to follow and to understand why we are not talking about digital strong, ar uh, strong arm or they put a lot of calculations inside text, which might have been more readable if you include some visualizations. 
Moving on to my takeaways. So first of all, I learned that improvement of individual components can lead to improvement stagnation of the whole device if the performance enhancement does not really evolve at the same speed. So I think this is an important takeaway. If you want to improve your device, of course, you need to improve your separate components, but still you need to keep an eye on um, consistency there. Otherwise, uh, we see what will happen. We will see a gap emerging. Next, the enhancement of performance is not sufficient to justify a merge of fabrication lines. So we really need to take also into consideration cost savings of amortizing the uh, fabrication costs, lower power and less board space need to be considered as well. I really like this because you can see, okay, here the scope is big and we should not only focus on improving one metric. We need to consider more, especially if we want to adapt it in the industry. Next, when introducing a new solution targeting the gap between DRAM and microprocessor speed, it is really key to evaluate against multiple benchmarks because they can significantly uh, differ as we saw for the specs and for the database and matrix um, computations. And we need to especially um, evaluate against the current state of the art because otherwise our solution cannot compete. Last but not least, um, even though the paper was written back in 1997, the first commercially available processing and memory solutions are only slowly emerging more than 20 years later. And it will, is surprising that this is actually demonstrating how long implementation can take in the industry. And we are like finally seeing these emerging on the market. So for any questions. <laughs> Okay, we'll have an, an extensive discussion. I'm happy to any time go back. Okay, then, yeah, maybe let's start with a very easy warm-up question. I hope you remember this slide here. So we talked how in 1997, we have this division. We are fabricating DRAM chips and microprocessors as separate camps. What is currently the status? What is... The industry like today in 2022 do we still have these two camps do we already see like um processing memory is the new standard do we see now like 5,000 camps what is your opinion easy warm-up yeah <laughs> okay we still have those two camps <laughs> okay well actually also we have a third one i think gpus okay. right come again gpus right mm -hmm. like most devices i i don't i i can't i can't think of any device i use today that doesn't have a graphics processing unit mm -hmm. inside it so yeah that would be my answer okay very good any more opinions uh, so basically we also have storage for example ssds mm -hmm. like they're of a vastly different paradigm than both processors and DRAMs. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we also have a lot of embedded processors that wasn't actually a thing back in 1997. And yeah, it's basically how many use cases we have for the for the computing devices, like uh, there's going to be how many camps in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Because the next slide I wanted to show you was first to like um, underline your point that you were making. We still kind of have these two camps in case of how we are fabricating those. Like on the left hand side, maybe it's a little bit outdated, but it was on March of 28 this year. Uh, this was the fastest current desktop processor uh, launched by Intel, but this is still just an a processor. On the left hand side, we just have um, the fastest current DRAM chip. We can see we are still like producing them separately, right? But now adding to the points which you mentioned later, do you know that one? Have you seen that one? <laughs> okay. Um, and what is special about it is basically what you mentioned, right? We we have more camps than these two, if we actually look into it. And maybe the next picture is even better. This one's just nicer. So we can see here, 
that we basically have many different specialized camps. Like for example, here we have an always on processor, but we also have an HDR video processor, high quality image signal processor. So we can't really now say we are always just still producing one kind of microprocessor. So this is, I think, quite important to, to notice as a difference from around 25 years ago. Okay. Anybody wants to add to this? Know something nice? It's a discussion. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Okay, so we saw that, or we kind of agreed that processing memory is not yet the standard, right? We still have this division. But what does the current processing memory landscape as a whole look like today? We, because we can't say that we just abandoned the idea, right? We see it here and there. So do you know any companies? I know some words were already, or some companies already fell in the last presentation, but it's your chance to repeat them or add on top of them. Do we see anything out there? Do we have any established product out there that actually implements this? You've mentioned some in the lectures. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, indeed. Um, but I want to I want to say, I mean, we have like a up mem and which is different. We have up mem and then we also have a 3D stack memory, right? Mm -hmm. These two are different, but they don't they don't really uh, have the same philosophy as what you presented, right? Because mm -hmm. what you presented is basically, oh, we have one shape does memory and it does computing, whereas these companies are basically assuming you have a processor and you still have DRAM, but this DRAM also has uh, processors and uh, I mean processing uh, capabilities as well mm -hmm. is different, right? It is to a certain extent. I think here it's important to still notice, like this is one of the very first paper that introduced this idea of of the unification, right? And this is still what we are basically um, talking about, if not unifying, bringing it closer together or working together. But yeah, absolutely. And this is also the one I wanted to mention. Uh, it's um, Upmem, I think that picture was shown in one of the last lectures. So basically, we cannot um, see it here, but um, basically, we have a lot of, they call it innovative data processors, DPUs, and they are actually included within the DRAM memory chip, so we cannot see them there inside. Anybody wants to add to this? Does anybody know when uh, they went public with it. I know a rough number, but maybe somebody knows more about it. I think it was around 2019, the first time this was launched. Okay. Nobody corrects me? Okay, then <laughs> I guess I'm right. Okay, and some other examples which were also shown in the lecture. So uh, um, so there are a lot of, opa, a lot of uh, startups working on it, uh, but compared to, I think, think their upmem has quite an advantage already. So these are just two more examples uh, where we can see processing and memory slowly getting adapted. Another question for you, I mean, we discussed it already a little bit extensively, but what further options do we have to, uh, do we have to improve? And here maybe what exactly do we want to improve is uh, one question that we raised during the lecture already, like we want to improve um, the performance, right? Uh, and the bottleneck is the, our data movement between DRAM and uh, microprocessors. So just to gather some ideas, what can we do? Do we have like a lot of ideas how we can improve or close the gap or maybe a paper that you are reading, which we'll see later? has some special idea, which we haven't heard so far. No one? Okay. Um, I asked that my mentors as well. Um, <laughs> Cause I was like, we don't have so, so many options. I thought there were more out there, uh, but I brought um, two of them. First of all, prefetching. Did anybody heard of that? Hand raise. Okay, so quite a few. So this is one approach how you can um, target this problem. Uh, secondly, of course, you can increase uh, cache size. 
but yeah, this one is also limited. Okay, uh, I think that's the last question I prepared, which would really interest me because you don't find many informations out there, but what would be interesting for me to know from you is why do you think did it take like more than 20 years to have like the basic idea of how you can address this problem? Um, why did it take more than 20 years to actually get adopted in the industry? What are like factors that limited its adoption? What do you think? There's no right or wrong. I can't really assess when you're wrong. Yes. Um, well, I guess one of the problems is definitely the industry itself mm -hmm. and um, the secrecy also. I noticed that in the last couple of presentations that it was also always mentioned that we don't actually know much about the DRAMs and like from the industry side. So it's really hard to uh, simulate the DRAMs also, I guess. And mm -hmm. so everything has to be done in real life. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, also it's expensive, I guess, mm -hmm. to do the research. And since the industry doesn't seem to want to change anything, I guess that's a problem. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good point. Like uh, it finally starts to get insensitive to actually change something because so far you could always like trick your way through it by um, using some kinds of quick fixes going always denser. Uh, but also I think it's, um, yeah, it is quite a challenging task to actually go from uh, these two camps to one also be adapted in the industry. Any more points? That was a really good one. Yeah, go for it. I think one thing that could be considered is that there, it, 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 the issue has been addressed in other ways or been attempted to address in other ways. So like you said, prefetching or uh, out of order machines have you know, more tolerance to, to waiting times mm -hmm. for, for DRAM. So it's only recently, maybe, I, I don't know any of the numbers, I'm just guessing, maybe only recently has it sort of come to the point that everything else has kind of been mm -hmm. exhausted and the gap is still getting bigger. So now people are sort of paying attention to, okay, well, <laughs> we did everything we can. Now, now what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Drop it in. Yeah, I was going to say, actually, uh, I was thinking, that may be the biggest pressure which makes this be such a hot topic now, such that like, for example, Samsung and HK Hynix are, are actually developing these chips is uh, because we are uh, ending, we're, we're basically out of Denard scaling, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's unclear how long, how much longer Moore's law is gonna continue. And so those two factors are putting a huge pressure on uh these companies to try to keep up kind of mm -hmm. and they were able to you know keep up with their own scaling and and moore's law but now they need to be more creative and actually think about think about this maybe yeah more how much here do you give it until this is the new standard let's if you assume this uh, this will be the new standard high um, hands yeah what do, you I mean, what do you mean by high long uh, years. I mean, we we've waited for 25 years to like um, see upmem, which kind of follows this idea, right? So, will we see upmem in like three years everywhere? This idea. Three years. Three, three years, years is uh, not a lot. I think five years. I'm not sure. I I think there's like so much uh, like where i mean the, is the is the transformation hierarchy again right because mm. like we if you add that to the to the mix you also have to make a lot of changes changes in the whole um abstraction la layer hierarchy but i would say that since these big players like samsung and hk hynix are uh, coming into the market with these um pm enabled uh, chips then maybe this will cause a lot of very quick uh, changes and very quick adaptations uh, in the tool chains that we have today, and then maybe it's going to be sooner than than later. Yeah, you wanted to say something. I think also by adopted to what level do you mean? Because I think people who use you know who need the high memory constantly will mm -hmm. probably adopt it significantly faster than the average user. Mm -hmm. Whereas like most consumer devices are sitting idle. 99% of the time so I think most of it is is not actually being used so mm -hmm. do you actually 
have that memory bandwidth like uh, bottleneck is it is it a significant enough issue for consumer devices to actually care mm -hmm. uh, cuz yeah it is more expensive so mm -hmm. at least for now right like, mm -hmm. probably imagine it probably kind of trickle down like server like uh, like um, high like what's it called like you know compute nodes and then you know some kind of server and then eventually maybe mm -hmm. uh, to the consumer devices mm -hmm. a lot longer that's a really good point. Because <laughs> you're going, sitting close next sorry, to Sorry, we're, we're going back and forth here. <laughs> uh, but I was going to say, actually, I disagree with that because um, you said like 99% of the time it's sitting idle, right? But like you want your systems to be robust to the peak uses, right? You don't want to say, oh, your server is not accessed very often. Uh, but then what if it's, there's a hot topic on there and then like everyone accesses it. You want, you want this uh, system to be resilient to that peak. It's like even in, I don't know, CD design, you want your roads to be robust to uh, rush hour and not just being robust to average traffic at night. Mm -hmm. That's that kind of thing. Very so good maybe, maybe a good point for processing memory. I don't know. <laughs> More opinions on that. Yes. I'm thinking that it could be that companies were also reluctant to change maybe, and they wanted to convince themselves that this new technology actually works. Like they had their tried and tested methods already and they didn't want to switch as quickly. Maybe they thought they could improve on those. And there might also have been unforeseen consequences regarding the stability or production costs, stuff like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very good point. Mm -hmm. More. <laughs> Okay, um, I think these are all the questions I had for you. Maybe quickly, I would really like to thank my mentors who really took their time to just talk to me <laughs> about the um, paper and everything. So they helped me a lot to better understand it and also to better prepare it for you to hopefully understand it better. So also thank for you. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I'm happy to discuss further but i think we're already running out of time slowly so if you don't have any more questions um i think i'm done thank you yeah i think i will make some comments uh, then can people see or hear me yes maybe juan will make some more comments also but oh sorry <laughs> <laughs> i'm so sorry yeah. uh, yes yeah okay i don't know if you can see me on the screen but uh anyway it doesn't no matter, perhaps Maybe there is a way to put it over there. Uh, maybe one of maybe Altabak can do it. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, yeah, this was a uh, this was an excellent presentation. Thank you. No, right. on my way home. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, this was a very good overview of the uh, intelligent RAM paper uh, and also uh, the computer. I, I, uh, sorry, I couldn't hear you yet. <laughs> so. Oh, you cannot. You guys cannot hear me. Uh, I can I, hear you, but. but yeah. On Zoom, I think people can hear, but... Ah, uh, here you are. How about now? Yeah, on Zoom, it's okay. Maybe I'll, ah, this doesn't work. Yeah, you're good. It's, it's good now? Yes, absolutely. Okay, and the room can hear? Yes, very good. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll make some comments. So uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. I think you gave an ex excellent overview of the IRAM paper uh, and the earlier paper, uh, Compute DRAM was actually quite uh, well presented as well. So thanks for the presentations. Uh, so I'll make some comments related to, I mean, we scheduled these two papers for a good reason uh, together because they're both on processing in memory, right? Uh, and they're not the earliest and not the latest papers as well. So IRAM is certainly an influential paper, uh, but it's not the earliest paper on processing in memory. Earliest papers are from 1960s. So actually you, sa you said, why did it take 20 years? It's more like, why did it take 50 years? or almost close to 60 years. <laughs> well, you said at least 20, that's correct, but it's at least 50, <laughs> actually. So it's an idea that has been around for some time that people have envisioned. 
I think IRAM provides a nice comprehensive overview of it. Uh, in the past, people have proposed the idea, but they have not looked at many different aspects of it. IRAM came at a time uh, in the 1990s where people really uh, understood uh, a lot of the DRAM manufacturing issues as well as processor manufacturing issues uh, that it, it was able to cover uh, a lot of surface. And it's also a more of a position type of paper plus some evaluation. So it's not, a, as you as you recognize, it has raised a lot of questions, right? As opposed to uh, answering a lot of questions. It has some evaluation, but you realize, uh, you also uh, correctly realize that it's uh, evaluation is not the most strong point uh, of the work. So it's a, it's a comprehensive overview of processing in uh, near uh, memory issues. So I, in that sense, it's a very, a very interesting paper. But uh, it's, it's good to recognize that in the past, like in the 1960s, people had the same idea, but they didn't. At that time, DRAM was developing, uh, DRAM was invented in 1965. So the first papers in processing in memory appeared in 1969. And people were thinking SRAM actually at that time, because SRAM was also off chip. So uh, it's good to think about the history of it uh, a little bit. Uh, so that's what I'll mention. I, I, I should also mention that, um, I mean, today, uh, one thing that was not brought up as much is energy. Today, uh, data moment consumes huge amounts of energy. And that's, a, that's one of the major uh, reasons to re-examine these ideas from an energy perspective. Uh, and that was not examined as much in the past. And also technology scaling issues have been uh, very difficult for memory manufacturers. As a result, they're also looking into processing in memory, as we discussed. So basically systems are quite limited today by energy and performance. Uh, so we're, we're in a multifaceted situation. We covered this in the memory-centric computing lecture. Uh, so I think it was also correctly uh, recognized that uh, IRAM is a bit uh, aggressive in what it ex explores. This is great to do in research. Uh, basically, you want to really explore the boundaries, right? Uh, what is the most aggressive thing you can do in the sense that uh, it basically uh, said, we want to put processor and memory together and have nothing else in the system, <laughs> in a sense, right? Uh, but today, uh, people are thinking of processing near memory as, or, or processing using memory as accelerators, right? It's not more, it's not like this is the only thing in the system. It's more like CPU is still there, but let's, let's, uh, let's envision processing near memory or using memory as an accelerator for certain functions, certain operations, certain applications, but CPU still handles uh, some of the tasks. In that sense, it's not as aggressive, uh, which is probably easier to adopt uh, uh, also. Uh, I should also mention that uh, the compute DRAM work, uh, it's clearly not the first work that proposes uh, uh, using DRAM, uh, DRAM's analog computation capability, as was also indicated uh, earlier works actually showed this. Compute DRAM work was unique in the sense that uh, it, it was the first one to show that you can do this in a limited fashion in real DRAM chips. So that's actually quite good. In that sense, it opened some eyes uh, and then later works exploited this also. Uh, so the processing near memory has been around for a long time, but uh, this analog, uh, using the analog operational principles of memory, processing using memory, it was really developed in the... Uh, 2010s, uh, row clone, MBIT, those works are some of the first works as far as we know. Uh, maybe someone will pick, dig up some patents, but we haven't come up with any, uh, we haven't found any patents in this area also. So in that sense, this analog computation in memory is quite interesting. And it's, 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 it's basically a very new aspect of uh, processing using DRAM that papers like IRAM or, or, or papers in the 1960s on processing near memory did not consider. So it's, 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 uh, that's another reason why uh, the idea is really important to re-examine because there are new ways of uh, doing computation in memory that people have discovered much more recently uh, compared to like 60 years ago. So I should also emphasize that. That's uh, to, to give you a history uh, of processing in memory. Yes, it's been around for a long time, uh, but I think now we have a lot newer ideas and people are also maybe thinking about it uh, not as a very, uh, not in a very extremely aggressive way, but in a more realistic way, considering adoption issues uh, and also cost issues, and certainly because of the technology scaling uh, issues, uh, manufacturers are actually implementing some of the ideas. We'll see where it goes, of course.
Okay, that's all I, I wanted to say at this point. Maybe Juan has some more uh, to add. Yeah, I uh, wanted to add something very briefly. I completely agree with you, Honor. Um, the the um, yeah, I, I would like to um, well actually make a couple of points. I, I agree with Honor that um, the first paper is more novel in terms of uh, the type of computation that it is proposing. Uh, it's processing using memory, something that is uh, much newer than the idea of placing cores or placing compute units uh, near the um, near the memory arrays. And I think it's uh, for sure really promising. Uh, one uh, thing that I, I mean, the, the reason why I want to say something now is because at the very end, you guys ask yourselves if uh, we are going to see PIM becoming mainstream uh, in the next few years, right? It took 25 or even more 50 years uh, to become a reality. Is this going to uh, really become mainstream at some point? And, um, and um, is, is there going to be any pushback from users? Uh, I'm pretty positive in that sense, in that sense, pretty optimistic. Uh, the reason why we need PIM, um, uh, it's, it's clear because there is a lot of data movement uh, real workloads these days are using huge data sets and, um, and um, most of the computations show that are, mo most of the important applications show that they are memory bounding in real uh, systems. So PIM is necessary. Now, how difficult is going to be to adopt it? For sure, there are system, system integration issues that need to be solved and will be solved in terms of users i think that users are more and more uh, willing to use uh, either new systems uh, different types of processors it's been a while since we started to use uh, gpus and fpas in, in, in almost uh, everywhere or in many different um, uh, environments and i think that with pim is going to be more or less the same it's not more difficult to program a pim architecture than it is uh, programming uh, a GPU, it's much uh, easier than programming an FPA unless you are using high-level synthesis. So in that sense, I'm I'm pretty optimistic, and I think that we will also see uh, combinations. Hopefully, we will see combinations of processing using memory and processing near memory as if they were like two different execution units. More one that is going to be more. CMD oriented, the other one that is going to be more scalar oriented, probably. Uh, but I think that both uh, can combine and, and synergize in a very interesting way. So yeah, that's uh, all from my side. Thank you very much for the very good presentations. And I, I hope uh, yeah, we will continue next Thursday, I guess. Are we done? Yes. <laughs> <For today? laughs> okay, thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Right. <laughs>